Here in Pennsylvania, we've made it quite clear. We've made it clear across this Commonwealth, across this country, and globally that the time for institutions to protect their reputation over protecting victims is over. We have given survivors the opportunity to speak their truth. More than 1,000 people, 1,071 to be exact, have contacted our clergy abuse hotline in the last five weeks. Our agents listen to each and every one of those calls, speak to every one of those callers, and we're conducting further investigations where appropriate. The grand jurors noted their dual goals in the report. One goal was to provide transparency so that the public would finally know what had been going on in the shadows over decades here in Pennsylvania. Their second goal was to ensure that something like this could never happen again here in the Commonwealth. Since the release of the grand jury report, I've received the same questions many times. Why haven't more people been criminally charged? Because, of course, we could only charge two of those 301 predator priests because of our weak laws here in the Commonwealth. The other question they ask repeatedly is, how can we best protect victims? How can we help those victims of clergy sexual abuse? The answer is clear. Our laws do not go far enough here in Pennsylvania to protect victims of child sexual abuse and hold those accountable who cover it up. Understand that we ran each and every one of those 301 predator priests through what's known as the statute of limitations test and could only charge two. We ran each and every one of those Catholic Church leaders who enabled the abuse, who covered the abuse up through a statute of limitations test and we couldn't charge any of them. The 23 men and women of the grand jury who listened to gut-wrenching testimony over a two-year period of time, who reviewed more than a half a million pages from the church's own secret archives, had four specific recommendations to prevent this type of abuse and cover-up from ever happening again. First, the grand jurors called for eliminating the criminal statute of limitations for, for child sexual abuse. Second, they called for the creation of a two-year civil window so that victims could sue to get help for the counseling and the services they need because, of course, this abuse brings with it a lifetime of difficult challenges. Third, the grand jury called for the lawmakers to pass new laws to specify that confidentiality agreements do not cover or prevent communication with law enforcement. After all, church leaders repeatedly would strike fear in the hearts of those who were abused in their families to say that they couldn't go forward or suggest that they couldn't go forward and talk to law enforcement. And fourth, the grand, juror call, grand jurors called for clarifying penalties for continuing failure to report child abuse. Right now, the law covering an ongoing failure to report continuing sexual abuse punishes a reporting failure when the person knows or has reasonable cause to believe that the child is actively, actively being subjected to child abuse. Well, the grand jurors observe that the more common instances involved an abuser who may or may not be, quote, active as the law requires and may not be abusing the same child. Because of that, the grand jury recommends the language in the statute be changed to clarify that the continuing obligation to report, quote, while the person knows or has reasonable cause to believe the abuser is likely to commit additional acts of child abuse. The grand jury also recommends increasing the statute of limitations for failing to report ongoing acts of abuse, which right now stands at only a mere two years. Representative Stevens will provide more detail on this important initiative in the House. Look, the grand jurors wrote, we can't pass laws telling the church how to administer its internal operations, but we can demand that it inform authorities about rapists and molesters. Since the release of the grand jury report, we have heard many words from church leaders about their commitment to supporting victims and ensuring that this institutional abuse never happens again. 
A lot of words. A lot of words. But as I did five weeks ago, I challenge the seven bishops in Pennsylvania and the archbishop in Pennsylvania to do what these brave leaders are doing and support the four recommendations of this grand jury. So far, all we've gotten from these bishops and the archbishop is crickets. Not a single one of them have come out and said that they would support all four grand jury recommendations. The fact that they could oversee an institution that allowed for this abuse and supported the cover-up, including some bishops who occupy positions of authority here in Pennsylvania today, and not before these grand jury recommendations, is absolutely unconscionable. They still have a few days to do the right thing, to side with survivors like Mary, to demonstrate that they've actually learned something from these 23 grand jurors, to follow the lead of these responsible lawmakers. I hope they do the right thing. Sadly, history suggests that they will continue to place a premium not on survivors, but on their own institutional reputation. And that is simply wrong.